Robert Assarian was a pastor in the Islamic Republic of Iran. He boldly shared the gospel in the national language, Farsi. Government officials responded by putting him in solitary confinement. He faced loneliness and discouragement. But in the midst of his suffering, God spoke an important truth to his heart. God told me that if you are here, it is my plan. You know, because I have questions, challenge, say, Lord, why you allow them that they arrest me? Holy Spirit told me that I bring you here. This is my plan. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. My name is Todd Nettleton. Welcome back to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. You know, last week, Pastor Robert Assarian was with us. He grew up in the Islamic Republic of Iran as part of the Armenian community, considered to be traditionally Christian. The Armenian Orthodox Church was big on tradition, and Robert didn't learn or see what an authentic relationship with Jesus looked like. The Iranian government tolerated the Armenian church as long as they only used the traditional Armenian language in their services and as long as they didn't reach out to Muslims. But God got a hold of Robert Assarian's heart. He was transformed by the gospel. He wanted to share the truth he discovered with everyone, including in Farsi, the predominant language of Muslims in Iran. When he started doing that, he knew he had to prepare for persecution. We heard about that last week here on VOM Radio, and if you missed that, please go to vomradio.net and listen to the first part of this conversation, or find VOM Radio wherever you listen to podcasts and listen to the first half of our conversation. Pastor Robert talked about how he prepared for persecution. And finally, in 2013, the day came when government leaders came to Pastor Assarian's home to arrest him. It is very difficult because they came to our home early morning, and I was arrested before the eyes of my two boys. My wife was not at home at that moment, was at the school. For me, it was difficult that my small boys observed what happened. And then interrogation started. Then I was in solitary cell. You know, especially solitary cell is a difficult experience. Solitary cell is a small room, maybe two meters in two meters. Nothing is there. Uh, no bed, no newspaper, no book, no TV, nothing. Just a small uh, room. And uh, solitary cell was difficult for me. And then interrogations was difficult because for five or six hours, continuously, I was under interrogation and... Uh, uh, anyway, I was prepared myself for that because as a counselor, as a Christian counselor, I had a lot of counseling with people who had been in prison for a long time, were traumatized. And because of my contact with them, I knew a lot of things about the prison and what's going on there. So uh, I knew, but anyway, it was when you personally are involved in and felt it with your whole being, uh, still it is difficult, yes. So, yes, for, especially the first week was difficult for me, but then gradually I adjusted myself to the solitary cell situation. What was the charge? Or, you know, when the police were interrogating you, what did they want to know? Did they want to know who the other believers were? Did they want to know what was going on? What kinds of questions were they asking you? They knew many things, and... They try to just fill the void spaces that they were not aware, but they knew a lot of things because they have bugs in my office. They had some agents uh, in the church, which we thought they are Christians, believers, but they are just agents. They knew a lot of things and tried to just have more information. And my accusation was uh, action against the national security. They are, they are not arresting me as a preacher, as a Christian leader. No, my accusation was 
action against national security. And I say, what kind of action I had against my country? But, you know, they need to have a kind of political and legal reason. They cannot, they have not kind of law that put you in prison because of evangelism or because of that you're a Christian preacher. And then when a group like Voice of the Martyrs, you know, writes letters or says, hey, they've arrested this pastor for being a pastor, they can say, no, 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 it's it has yeah. nothing to do with religion. It's all about national security. Yeah, yeah. Because, for example, I had been many times in different embassies for my visa. When I uh, wanted to go to, for example, UK, we went to UK embassy in Tehran and just give my or passports, have a kind of interview and have a visa or going to, for example, Netherlands and uh, the accusation was you were in the embassies and giving them some information about your country. I say it is ridiculous. We just was there. We were there just for getting visa. And these kind of accusations uh, were the main accusations of them that we are spies. We are co co cooperating with uh, Western powers. And I told them, uh, look, I am Iranian. And for me, my country is precious, and I never give any information about my country to any country. And I never had been in this kind of activities. Police don't accuse me with these accusations. But, you know, they, they try to uh, find a reason to put you in the prison, to keep you in the prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned that at that first week was very, very difficult, and then you kind of adjusted to life in solitary confinement and life in prison talk a little bit about those adjustments how did you adjust physically how did you adjust spiritually uh, to sort of work past that really difficult first couple days uh yes yeah, so uh physically is not problem anyway there is some kind of food and you are lying on the ground but spiritually and psychologically there's a lot of pressure i talked about my family what's going on there i talked about the church what will happen for the church members and a lot of interrogations, accusations. But uh, I started to pray, worship, and then I started to preach. I imagine that I stand before a congregation and I started to preach for them in English, for that imaginary congregation. Uh, there was some exercises in the small room. And for uh, just walking in that small space hundreds of times, and for example, I try to remember the verses of the Bible. I try to remember the books that I read. I try to remember my childhood memories. So these kind of things. Uh, you know, Paul Apostle uh, went through horrible persecution, flogging, prison, uh, torture, uh, stoning, uh, a lot of problems. When you reading the Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 24, this is the one of the verses that I like it. Colossians 1, 24, I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affections for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Paul is rejoicing in his sufferings, and he look at that sufferings as completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Reverend Robert Asarian, a former prisoner for Christ in Iran. Uh, Robert, it's interesting that you composed sermons while you were in solitary confinement. Uh, the founder of the Voice of the Martyrs, Richard Wormbrand, also spent much time in solitary confinement in Romania and also uh, preached sermons inside of solitary confinement. That was one of the things he did to keep his spirit and his mind sharp. So uh, I'm interested that you and he uh, use that same method to kind of both pass the time and also stay connected spiritually to what God was doing. Yes, because I read that book uh, in God's Underground. I read the Rochard Rombrand books and it was very interesting book and really uh, impressed me when I was young. And something which helped me so much there was a time that Lord spoke with me and God's message gives me new strength and comfort. Twice, twice in the prison, Lord spoke with me directly. Uh, and that was a big comfort for me. And I found out that I'm not alone. Lord is with me and I am in God's plan. God, God told me that if you are here, it is my plan. 
Wow. After that, there was a big peace and comfort in my heart. And I said, okay, Lord, if you bring me here, so I can be here for years. From that point, my fear gone that maybe they keep me for a long time. Uh, when I found out that it is God's plan that I am in the prison, uh, that message from the Lord gave me a deep comfort and peace. And after that, my fear gone that can I, can I continue in this situation? Because, you know, solitary cell is difficult. I, I thought with myself, if they keep me in the solitary cell for six months, what will happen with me? What will happen with my mental health? Health. But after that message, I say, okay, if they even keep me for one year, I'm okay because God's bring me here. So how long did you end up being in solitary confinement? Uh, just one month. Just one month, not more. And then two weeks, I was in another cell with three other people. And then how did you come to be released from prison? They told to the church that they provide the bail. And conditionally, conditionally, they set me free so that there will be court and trial for me. So after seven, uh, six weeks, almost six weeks, they set me free. And after your release, I know at, at eventually you made the decision we're going to have to leave Iran. How did, you, how did you come to that point of saying we have to go someplace else? Because we were under a lot of pressure by the authorities, leave the country. But that was not the main reason again. main reason was that we couldn't contact with any believer because we are always under observation and control. And when we talked with someone or contacted with someone, immediately that person was in trouble, in problem. So I see that if I stay in Iran, if we stay in Iran, we couldn't do anything efficient. We couldn't do, we couldn't ministry. So because everybody who contacted us had a kind of trouble at that time. So we, we came to conclusion that it is better uh, exit from the country so that have more opportunities to serving God's people. It's very difficult to be a pastor when you're not allowed to talk to any of the members of your congregation, isn't it? Yes, exactly, exactly. Do you think, and I, this question kind of grows, I had the opportunity to interview Pastor Andrew Brunson for Voice of the Martyrs Radio, oh. Uh, and one of the things he talked about being in prison in Turkey was, uh, you know, he would read, in fact, he read some of Pastor Wormbrand's books. And yeah. Pastor Wormbrand would talk about how he was victorious in prison. And, and Andrew said he felt a sense of shame that, you know, why can't I be like Pastor Wormbrand was? Why can't I be like all these heroes of the faith that I've read about that were so victorious in the midst of persecution? And here I am in prison, and I'm broken by it, and I don't want to be here, and I don't like it. Do you think that some Christians in Iran even feel that sense of, wow, why, why am I feeling this way? Why, am I, why is this trauma bothering me? If I was a better Christian, it wouldn't bother me. Do, do you think that's a response that some have as they go through persecution? Yes, yes. But problem is that we must help people that they accept their humanity accept their humanness, accept that they are clay jars. You know, even Paul the Apostle has the times of depression, has the times of pressure. When you look at the Second Corinthians chapter 1, he says that we were desperate. And even, even the Rembrandt, I remember his uh, book, that there was a time that he also was depressed. And, you know, Jesus Christ had the experience that he called his disciples that please pray with me and so we must be uh, also accepting or brokenness or humanity and when we say that we must be victorious in Christ even in this situation it means that when you went through all of these experiences hardships uh, the end result is more Christ likeness the end result is that you coming to new maturity in Christ the end result is the deep comfort and joy of the holy spirit but it doesn't mean that always every time in every moment you are full of joy no i don't think that god has created us in this way we have emotions we have doubts personality weaknesses and blind spots so i think that it is a non-realistic uh, view about human beings even jesus christ in his humanness 
has kind of an anxiety and anxiety and so it is when we're talking about victory i i look at it in the big perspective of our spiritual life at at the end at the end we must be in a position that we claim lord thank you that you let me in in the prison no i have more maturity i have full of peace and joy so uh, the end result is important not every moment of the process i think that i think that's a very good word a great word we're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Reverend Robert Assarian. He's the director of training for Pars Theological Seminary. Robert, you mentioned that after you were released from prison, uh, you were not allowed contact with other people in the church. You were cut off and essentially had to leave the country. How is it for Christians in Iran now after they are persecuted? If they are uh, interrogated or they're locked in prison and then they're released from prison, what happens to them after the words? Uh, it, and also, how do they process the experience if they are cut off from the rest of the body of Christ? Yeah. It is a very good question. Actually, most of the leaders who had been in the church, one of the difficult experiences that they have is when they come from the prison, set free, other believers are afraid to contact them, and they became so alone. And the time that they need mostly the support of other believers and fellowship with them, most of them, I can say majority of them, are alone because people are so afraid. Because, you know, after that, they are always control and observation and authorities to try find out who is approaching them. So one of the big problems of our leaders is, is that when they, after the prison, their difficult time is started. I even heard some of them that when we were in the prison, uh, we were not so bad. No, our situation is much worse because in the prison, they know that they are standing for Christ. But out when, when they are in their homes, they see that other believers are looking at them with suspicion. Nobody tr are coming to meet them. So most of them have difficult time after prison time. And uh, most of them have not the, the opportunity to process the problem that trauma bring to their life, the symptoms. They need this debriefing. They need talking with someone. But the problem is that there are qualified counselors there. The problem is that if there is someone there also, uh, there is the danger of that he will be arrested. So they are not contact with the leaders. So... One of the most big problems of the leaders is uh, after the prison, they are in the long, lo loneliness, isolation, and uh, so that supportive help of the church is not available for them, unfortunately. And the churches has not any kind of mechanism that help these people. Yeah. It's interesting to me that the the time when they need prayer the most may be after they get out of prison. Uh, you know, we, we think of someone who's in prison and we're praying for them, Lord, you know, sustain them while they're in prison. And then they get released from prison and our natural prayer is, wow, praise the Lord. That's great. He answered our prayer. They're out of prison. Uh, but that may actually be the time they need prayer even more yeah. than when they yes. were in prison. Exactly. Exactly. And for most of them, their depression is after release of the prison because nobody is there, nobody talking with them. They are isolated. And sometimes they are so surprised that why your brothers and sisters are behaving with us in this way. And I understand what's happened. I understand the fears of the other Christians and other house church leaders and network members. It's understandable, but the problem is that that period of time is very important for the recovery and the healing of the person who had been in the prison. But unfortunately, most of the times they are isolated, so alone, and most of them are suffering from deep depression and the other symptoms of trauma. So I would encourage our listeners, if you're praying for a Christian in prison, and boy, we want you to do that, we encourage you to do that, uh, prisoneralert.com is a website of Christians in prison, but don't just pray while they're in prison. They might actually need your prayers even more after their release uh, than they do while they're in prison. 
We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Reverend Robert Assarian. He is the Director of Training for Pars Theological Seminary. Robert, the last questions I have for you. We always try to equip people to pray, and we have just talked about uh, praying for released prisoners as they kind of process their experience. Talk to me a little bit, though, and, and equip our listeners to pray for the church more broadly in Iran right now. I know uh, the pandemic has affected Iran. I know uh, persecution affects the church in Iran. How can we pray for Christians in Iran right now? Uh, let me uh, give you a testimony which showing your listeners how much prayer is powerful. I remember when I was in solitary, sir, every Sunday uh, I, I felt a big peace, big comfort, uh, very unique presence of the Lord. Of course, other days also I had that presence, but the Sundays were very special. And I myself was wondering what's going on. Why Sundays? I am so happy. What What's happened at Sundays? And then one day I remembered that this, this is the Sunday and all the churches in the world are prayed for me. Then I found out that only in the United States, AOG churches all around the United States, more than 12,000 churches were prayed for me at the Sundays. So, you know, uh, I didn't know that, but Sundays, the atmosphere of my solitary service was quietly different, quietly changed. Uh, so the prayer really works. My instruction is that continually pray with favor with the prisoners or prayers. Or prayers, it really works. Or prayers is really bring big comfort and comfort uh, strange to the prisoners. Uh, something which is very important is sometimes we thinking that, uh, so uh, why I'm praying, what will happen? But it really matters. It really uh, bring a lot of change in the life of the prisoners. So please continue to pray if it's possible. Pray with, with fasting. As God's word says, pray with the prisoners as you yourself are prisoners. In the Hebrews, it says that Remember prisoners, as yourself are prisoners, we must identify ourselves with prisoners in a way that imagine that we ourselves now in prison and uh, this kind of identification gives your intercessory prayer a new uh, power. So fasting prayer and uh, serious prayer for the prisoners. One last question, Robert. How can we pray for Christians who have been traumatized, uh, either you know, through persecution, through interrogation, through time in prison? How can we pray for them as they kind of process and try to recover from that trauma? First of all, we must pray that they experience God's healing, God's healing presence. I believe that God's healing presence can heal them from the symptoms of the trauma. Then we pray that uh, they have the availability to be in contact with good counselors or good resources, some books or some competent and experienced Christian leaders who can help them. Because as I mentioned, uh, their main problems many times after release from prison is that they're isolated and alone. So pray that God brings to them experienced leaders or counselors, or people who can really listen to them and help them that they uh, healed from the symptoms of the trauma. Reverend Robert Assarian, he's the director of training for Pars Theological Seminary. He is also a former pastor and a former prisoner inside the Islamic Republic of Iran. Robert, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, I believe we've inspired our listeners to pray this week and, and help them pray more knowledgeably for the country of Iran and for Christians suffering persecution. So thank you so much for sharing with us this week. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's an honor for me to be with you. Well, thank you for being with us. If you are just now joining us, you can listen to this entire conversation at vomradio.net. I would encourage you to listen, even go back to last week's episode and listen to Robert talk about his own experiences as a persecuted Christian in Iran, as well as this week talking about how we can pray for those going through persecution right now. 
Again, this is Voice of the Martyrs Radio. As always, connect with us online at vomradio.net and join us again next week as we continue to talk about what God is doing around the world, even in hostile and restricted nations. Thank you for being with us.